Well, hello, everybody. And uh, I have had some opportunities to do some speaking before where uh, the last thing between the audience and a meal was me. I will say that this is probably the most compromising position I've ever been in before to be the, uh, the last thing between you and $1,000. So uh, that's pretty tough, but thank you, thank you. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, uh, I come, as the judge was saying, I come from the private sector. I have been involved myself in five different companies. Um, I have led uh, successfully four of them, and I've also been through the School of Hard Knocks with one of them. And I'm gonna talk about that here uh, in a second, but I never had a compartment for serving in the public sector before uh, for 25, 26 years of my working career. Uh, working in the private sector was very rewarding. It was something that I've always enjoyed doing. And then uh, lo and behold, uh, frankly, it was the, uh, the Lord's plan for my life, but you just never know how doors open or doors close or, or how the timing of certain things can work out. But in my particular case, uh, when Governor Bevin became governor, he really appreciated that in order for Kentucky to become the best version of itself, it was gonna require a, a double down effort in economic development in order to really start getting some momentum going, attracting industry to the state, and also serving with excellence the companies that are already here in Kentucky. When I think about the, um, the seats that you all now fill and the responsibilities that you have, I, I can only imagine uh, often the pressure you must feel. I can, I can imagine at times you're sitting there in your own office uh, across the state. You're wondering, does anybody even really appreciate what you're having to deal with? Your, your budgets uh, are getting pinched, and pinched might be a light word. Perhaps you just recently dealt with some turnover in your own office, and uh, you're wondering, you know, how in the world am I gonna attract some talent to come and, and work in this arena? Your uh, constituents in your local area continue to knock on your door and say, when are we gonna get more jobs? When we, we read about the county next door landing a big one or something, and are, are those guys up in Frankfurt uh, listening to us? Have you been up there? Have you been talking to them? When, when are we going to uh, get a, a, a good announcement like that? If any of those things resonate with you, show of hands real quick. Does that hit home? Pretty close to home? Okay. It's no fun being in a pressure cooker at times, right? And uh, for uh, any of our brides that are here or spouses that are here, Thank you to you all for putting up with us late at night when we uh, are wide awake and we're worrying about such things. I've got a small video here that I want to play for you. It's a, it's a small clip, um, maybe from a movie that you will recall, Apollo 13. And I want to play this here for you for a second, so let's see if this uh, will come up, please. We have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We have a CO2 filter problem on the wind block. Five filters on Anything over 15, you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. And the ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. It just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Wrap it. Fit into the hole for this, using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. Maybe get some coffee going too, someone. Does that feel like your job at times? Huh? Feels like my job at times, to be honest with you. I'm going to share with you a personal story, and it's going to tie into the topic that I want to. Uh, 
uh, touch on here this uh, morning while we're together about the importance of regional thinking and regional economic development. A personal story that I have for you, and this might, might resonate with many of you, I, I did have a, a family business with my father. We, we had a company for uh, just over 20 years. It was a very mature manufacturing business. I remember when I entered it in the early 1990s, I remember my dad putting his hand on my shoulder and basically saying, hey son, if you just hold the wheel steady, take good care of our existing customers, don't rock the boat too much, this thing's gonna be a good cash cow, it's taken good care of your mom and I, it'll take good care of you and your family, don't rock the boat, no pressure. And, and for a decade plus, it, it was truly that way. When I thought about our competition, I knew I had competitors in the states of uh, Wisconsin and Nebraska. I could always keep my eye on them. I knew exactly how they might handle a particular situation. And while we fiercely comp competed against each other, it was a relatively predictable marketplace and it was calm. None of us in our industry at the time ever foresaw what was going to come. And in 2001, I'll never remember when, Pres I never forget when President uh, George W. Bush passed steel tariffs to protect the domestic steel industry. It may have been good for that market, but that, what ensued from there was a, manu a small manufacturing recession, and it began to open up the door to companies in China starting to be able to manufacture for the very first time products in our space. And at first, I was delighted with that strategy because I could now begin procuring from China products at a much less expensive rate, adding it to my portfolio and increasing the offering that I was making to my own customers. And in 2005, 2006, I was sitting atop a company that had never performed at such a high height. I was making more money than I really ever deserved to make. My family was pleased and, and all was good. And yet, you know what, deep down inside, I was so anxious. I was so uncomfortable. I was so, um, un whoops, let me go backwards here. How do we do that? We'll go here to there. I was so uncomfortable because while I was having great success, I knew there was a storm brewing on the horizon. And that storm was China. And in the years 2006, 2007, I sat down with my closest advisors and I said, look, here's my business model, here's what's going on, but this isn't going to survive. What do you think I do? And their message to me was, Vivek, what's your worst case scenario? What do you think you need to do to adjust your business model and get there as fast as you can? For me, the worst case scenario was I was gonna have to cut my business by two thirds. So I was gonna have to cut back employment, reduce the whole entire business model so that we could just survive because I did believe there was a big storm brewing on the horizon. That storm coming my way, that tsunami, was China, because what China decided to do in my industry by 2007 and 2008, they decided to go around my business and begin selling products to my customers at 30% below my material cost. So before I ever put a coil of steel in a stamping press, I have customers calling me up saying, hey Vivek, I'm paying $10 for something that I can now buy of equivalent quality for seven. I wonder for each of you, when you think about your budget pressures and the pension burden and, the, and, the, and almost the, the pressure you feel to land jobs, if, in, if on many days you too feel like you've got a storm brewing on the horizon and what are you gonna do? Because if you walk outside of the barn in this picture and you look out one way, it's bright and sunny and everything's pretty calm looking and, and that's how we all naturally wish it would be every day. But then if we go out on the back side of the barn as depicted in this picture, 
we stand there all by ourselves and we say, oh my goodness, how am I going to survive this? I think from an economic development point of view, one of the things I want to encourage you all to think about, and this might be some outside of the box thinking for you, you may not be accustomed to this, but as a CEO playing in this public sector space for the very first time, I have a responsibility, I believe, to communicate to you a perspective that perhaps does not get often communicated. We have on our state flag this motto that says, united we stand, divided we fall. But frankly, if I may rip the Band-Aid off, boy, with 120 counties in this state, we could never be more divided at times. And from an economic development point of view, you know, I've had the pleasure of getting to know many of you over the course of three years, but we have layers of economic development agencies, starting with your offices and your local people or it may be chambers, it may be associations, it may be the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development, it may be agriculture. You, you know, we have layer upon layer upon layer of interest all trying to be pro-growth, and yet we're operating in an environment where money is getting tighter and tighter. It's harder to find critical talent to, to do the job, so what do we do? My call to you is to begin thinking, like I had to think back in 2006, my competition is not the county next door. My competition is Indiana, Tennessee, Ohio, North Carolina, Texas, India, China, Europe, all of these places want every single job that you want in your own backyard. I offer to you a, a paradigm now, a different way of thinking that I believe over the next several years we need to embrace if we as a team, if Team Kentucky are going to be competitive. And that is up here on the board, you know, budgetary, the, the, the benefits of us working more together as we can make the most of what budgets we have. Marketing and sales dollars are really hard to come by right now. If you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, you will see where we just launched a, a, a campaign into Illinois, kind of like shooting missiles into Illinois. We've dropped nine billboards there. I've got a social media campaign going overhead to contact every CEO, CFO, and corporate suite executive in the boardroom, and then I've got two uh, project managers out of our cabinet who for the next six months while those billboards are up are going to be knocking on doors and asking CEOs to consider coming to Kentucky. But that's just one pilot campaign. We need a lot more money to be able to do that. Your, these, these efforts on our part will benefit your community. What does it begin to look like to pool our resources and work together? Secondly, talent is very hard to come by. And I'm not talking about the talent that our employers employ. I'm talking about the talent that works for us. For every one of you in here who have an economic development professional working for you, you go back to them today and you said, hey, I met some crazy guy with a foreign name named Vivek. And you know what he told me to do? Tell you? He told me to tell you economic development professional to stop going to all the adult field trips that the economic development professional community typically likes to go to where they socialize with each other and start becoming a hunter. Your job economic development professional is to get out and hunt. If your economic development professional is not traveling one day of every week, is not in Frankfurt engaged with us, if they are not traveling around the world on trade mission trips, going to where the customers are, then they are missing out on opportunities. And to my fellow professionals who might be here, I'm sorry, but this is not a game. Because the elected leaders in this room want more jobs and more companies to come to your community. Well, if you want more companies and more jobs to come to your community, you have to get out and hunt. It's a contact sport. I tell my team every day, you get out and hunt, you stalk, you put that target in the crosshairs, you better be good at taking the shot, 
And when you make the kill and you bring it back, by golly, it better not be a chipmunk, because a chipmunk is not going to feed our communities. It's got to be something bigger than that. And we need talent. You need talent inside of your offices that is thinking and acting that way. The benefit of also a regional strategy is we start to cut out waste and we start to get lean. And I don't have enough time to go into all of that in great, great detail, but I would just offer to you, what does it begin to look like to combine our resources? And as the last point on this slide says, it be, we begin to create synergy where one plus one does not equal two, but one plus one be, begins to equal four, five, or six. And there are some leaders in this room who get this. There are some judges in this room who understand what it means and what it can look like to collaborate with counterparts and counties next door, and it's working. And if you're not doing that in your own backyard, I would encourage you to begin thinking that way. At the Cabinet for Economic Development, when, when I want you to know my perspective on this. When our team thinks about what a regional strategy begins to look like, this is not set in stone. Don't take this to be the gospel, and by no means is it. But it is our approach to how we, we kind of divide the state and we look at it. So we look at ourselves as the headquarters to economic development. And I don't use headquarters in terms of a top-down approach, but I use headquarters from, a, from the perspective, we are the corporate support center. Our job is to serve you. You have a piece of paper and pencil on your table. Uh, get ready with it here. I'm going to give you a number here in a few minutes. And I, if you want to write it down, you can write it down. But our job is to serve you, to help you accomplish your goals and objectives. And our perspective on the state of Kentucky is somewhat uh, viewed as this map presents. And these are the types of regions that we look at and how we, how we uh, go about um, just building up the state at large. And what would it look like if within these different colored zones where you may be located, you started working with your neighbors and your partners in such a way where these silos begin to break down, budgets, the appropriate budget dollars began to come together, and we, um, we partnered and we, we paired our talent, as I've been mentioning. What would that begin to look like? A phone number that I have for you, it's my personal cell phone number. My personal cell phone number is area code 502, 550-7302, 502-550-7302. I never answer a call I don't recognize. Please don't, I ask for forgiveness in advance. Don't be offended by that. But you text it, you call it, you leave a voicemail. I'll do my personal best to return that call and at least let you know I got it and we're on it. I don't have a really large cabinet. I only have about 72, 73 people on my team, but 63% of the record business development that we have clocked under Be Governor Bevin's administration, and I'm sure the governor talked about this when he opened it up, $22 billion. 63% of that comes from existing industry. You are closest to the existing industry in your backyard than we are. Anytime we hear of an existing company having a challenge, having a problem, they're, they're confused on how to navigate successfully the halls of government over in Frankfurt. And even though we wear these red tape pins and I get asked all the time what hair barbers association do I belong to, uh, the truth is we're trying our, our darndest to cut red tape and bureaucracy, but you call me, you throw me a text, and you know that it'll be my privilege, my pleasure, as long as I have the opportunity to serve and keep chopping wood, to help you get an answer as quick as possible to your issue. The other 37% of our record economic development growth 
comes from getting out and meeting new businesses. We are traveling all the time. Again, sales is a contact sport, and we get the pleasure of selling this great state of Kentucky, and, and I look forward to doing that in partnership with you. Might have to do a dance here, right? There we go, right? In closing, this slide just best to me depicts where we are in the race. Our administration, our team is just out of the gate. We're just kind of coming around turn one. We are the lead horse, by the way, in this picture. You are the lead horse. Kentucky's the lead horse. You know, what's amazing is how many times we travel right now and those those mutual competitors that we have, remember the competitors are not the county next door, the mutual competitors that we have in Tennessee and Indiana and Ohio, when we run into them at public events, they all keep saying, oh my goodness, what are you guys doing there? Well, we're hustling, we're working our tails off. And I am convinced that in greater partnership with each of you and in greater collaboration with you, we have not even begun to reach our potential. You know, right now when we travel around the world and we say, hey, we're from Kentucky, what do you think is the number one thing that the world knows Kentucky for? Huh? The number one thing the world knows Kentucky for is chicken. Kentucky Fried Chicken. And then it's usually followed by the Derby, Bourbon, and Muhammad Ali Boxing. The world knows us for chicken, boxing, a drink. The world does not know that per capita, Kentucky makes more automobiles than any state in the country. The world does not know, and you may not be aware of this, that we are second to Washington State. We export more aerospace components than any other country or state in the country. The world does not know, particularly with Amazon Prime going into northern Kentucky, we are now the world's headquarters for logistics and getting products shipped around the world. It is my pleasure to serve you. It is my pleasure to help you accomplish your goals. And I hope you'll use my phone number, and I look forward to working with you to help us achieve our personal best. Thank you very much.